I know um, that Dr. Hanbidge and I stand between uh, you and dinner. Um, <laughs> and so I'm gonna take you on this little journey of um, the twisted side of pediatrics. If you are, I find a pediatric imager, you have to have a sense of humor because your day doesn't always go well. And it's not uncommon in my daily practice that someone throws up on me. Um, so you have to take things with a grain of salt. But in all of the imaging that we do, there's a lot of focus on emerging technologies, the latest and greatest equipment, um, new applications. And while those are developments that certainly push our specialty forward, I would argue that our greatest skill and our greatest tools are our eyes, our hands, and our hearts. Your eyes see, but you need to look. And you need to understand what it is that you see. The other thing, though, is that if you've already made up your mind before you start looking, you won't see things for how they might be. And so even though some of the things I'm gonna show you today are a little unusual, we didn't get them right. And that's why I'm showing them to you, so that hopefully if you open your mind and hearts to these diagnoses, you might get them right the first time around. So with that. So by the end of this session, um, hopefully you have a greater appreciation of types of torsions and volvulus higher index of suspicion for some types in certain clinical presentations, be aware of torsion, detorsion scenarios, and know to look for the vascular pedicle and features of torsion in various clinical entities. So what are we gonna look at today? Dr. Hanbidge was right. Um, I guess I am fairly predictable. I did include ovaries in this. We're gonna look at testicles, appendages of the testis, and epididymis. Uh, Mid-gut vulvulus this again because I believe this time it'll be the sixth time and then I'm done uh, talking about that. Other parts of the bowel, stomach, spleen, liver, a picture of um, kidney as well and lung torsion. So ovarian torsion, as Dr. Hanbridge said, um, is or can be due to either large cysts that can increase the risk um, or masses that involve the ovary, but it also can be just idiopathic. And the reason uh, that the ovary contours is that the medial aspect is suspended by the ovary the ovarian ligament, and they're also connected to the broad ligament, but the lateral and posterior aspects are untethered, and as such are free to move. Typical location of torted ovaries, that's important, because if you're only looking in the right end next to you, you may not find the ovary. And frequently, they, when they torsed, um, become midline and superior in position. But they may even cross to the opposite side. So to see two on one side, clearly that's a problem. But if you only saw one, then that's even more concerning. Variable perfusion and internal hemorrhage can create heterogeneous appearance of the parenchyma. And low pressure venous system includes first, causing edema and follicular and ovarian enlargement. But the issue here, as Dr. Hanbidge had said, is that presence of vascularity alone does not exclude torsion. The venous um, flow will go first, and you may still have arterial flow. Um, I'm a little jealous, to be honest, of Dr. Uh, Hanbidge's pictures, because all of mine are transabdominal. That's how we do it in children, and we pray for a full bladder. So in this case, we have a midline ovary, you can see that it's quite heterogeneous with regards to the stroma centrally and the peripheral position of follicles, both in the uh, transverse and the midline view. And here you can see that the ovary, as we said, was congested, heterogeneous looking tissue, peripheral flow with poor to no venous flow internally. And then you do see arterial flow, um, you can characterize it and sometimes see high arterial resistance and lack of end diastolic flow due to the uh, perfusion. Now this is a case where um, ovarian torsion was thought to be present, but it was a little uncertain. And this child had um, torsion, detorsion, pain, no pain, and a lesion was seen on ultrasound. And in this case, you can see that the pedicle, as you're going through, is twisting around and then the, it's inferiorly facing with regards to the 
ovary, and this is a mature teratoma with the claw of normal ovarian tissue along the side with small follicles. And as was shown on the ultrasound image, if you scanned through this along the short axis, so making sure that your transducer is orthogonal to the long axis of the, of the pedal, you will see the twisting. So in this case, just scanning laterally wouldn't obtain that if you did that, but it's along the length of the pe vascular pedicle. Antenatal ovarian torsion does happen too, and this is something that can be quite difficult. Um, children, uh, frequently they'll have a prenatal ultrasound, there'll be a cyst that's seen potentially, it'd be an uncertain uh, etiology, can be quite complex, and the difficulty happens in when you actually first image the patient. In this case, we can see a normal uh, right ovary with a follicle. And in the left index, uh, no ovary was demonstrated. We see this other mass lesion with the epigenic rim and really no vascularity internally. It's inferior to it, but separate from the ovary, and it's got this calcified rim. So this then was followed over time. The thought was that it was probably an antenatally torsed ovary that had got, undergone calcification. And the surgeon was quite worried because there was concern that this might be a, a teratoma again. But the AFP things were normal, so we just followed it up. A short-term follow-up should be fine. Again, in seeing this two months later, you can see that this has undergone interval involution and is more densely calcified, smaller in size. And again, the right ovary with the normal follicle is seen separate from this. Now, you would think that a torted ovary would resolve fairly quickly if it's left, but uh, perinatal torted ovaries may take more than 12 months for involution, so don't be surprised if you see it um, up to that length of time. Next mo most common uh, entity that we see with regards to torsion is at least a request for um, an exclusion of testicular torsion. Testicular torsion is a true surgical emergency, as is ovarian torsion, and it's often seen in uh, peripubertal boys and young adults. You can see uh, reactive hydrocele, thickening of the skin, and it's uh, attributed to the bell clapper deformity, the fact that it's not tethered within the scrotal sac. If the grayscale appearance is normal, there's good evidence that the testis is viable, and an abnormal appearance may indicate edema or infarction. The twisted cord or the twisted knot sign is something that you really need to look for, and that can be seen as a heterogeneous vascular mass superior to the testis. In children, it's frequently difficult to obtain uh, Doppler flow within testis at all, let alone ascertain whether they're normal or abnormal, and they're not always in the same location. But hopefully, uh, you can assess whether it's altered relative to the opposite side. In this case, you can see that there's asymmetric flow with the same parameters that are being used here. So 2.2, both uh, testes side by side within the scrotal sac. You see that the skin thickening overlying it and the asymmetric perfusion with the right much greater than the left. Scanning higher up, just into the uh, inguinal scrotal junction, you can see the twisted appearance of the torsion knot in this child with acute testicular torsion. So it's important to look for the asymmetry, as I said, and search for the torsion knot. Late testicular torsion, um, as I said, edematous can be quite abnormal appearing. This was a child that had a blue scrotum since birth, and you can see thickening of the uh, tunica albuginea, a vascular testis, uh, possible central necrosis. Again, in this age group, get, trying to get Doppler flow within the testis itself can be quite difficult. But usually if you persevere and the child can be quietened, you can usually find at least some, and in this case there was none. Because it had already been so long at this point, there was not much uh, that was done, so he was followed. And you can see at day five of life, the asymmetry between the, the uh, hemiscrota on the right side, the normal testicle, and the abnormal on the left. At six weeks of time, you start to see calcification peripherally, and some persistent scrotal skin thickening. So again, it's a similar theme. As things are torted, then the body tries to wall it off and calcification around it. 
It's important, though, to know the history because once you see calcification involving a testicle or within a hemiscrotum, people get really excited, worried about other masses or other disease processes. So being able to follow it and have previous or short interval follow-up is quite helpful. At four months of follow-up, you can see that the testicle on the left side is now a very thickly calcified, peripherally calcified structure with really no discernible features of a testicle. And at nine months of follow-up, it's just a little calcified nubbin. Antenatal testicular torsion, if it happens early, again, the process of involution will happen in utero, and then a non-palpated testis can be found or searched for. And that's frequently a question as to whether or not something has gone on before or whether it's simply an undescended testis. In this case, uh, the search was on to find uh, the testicle and in this case, it was uh, simply involuted and calcified beside the adjacent uh, testis with hydrocele. What else? So it's not frequent that the request for testicular torsion actually yield a diagnosis of testicular torsion. So what else is out there? Well, certainly epididymitis is one thing that we see quite commonly. But the other thing is to look for um, portion of the appendices, which are not a surgical entity. Usually those are dealt with by uh, pain management and reassurance. So it's in the differential diagnosis of acute, sc acute scrotal pain. The appendix epididymis can be between 3 and 17 millimeters. Uh, you can see inflammation of the surrounding area and can be difficult to differentiate between the appendix of the testis or the epididymis, but the good news is the treatment's the same. So um, it's usually okay if you're not quite right. Um, what you see is an avascular mass adjacent to the testis. Uh, in this case, it's usually within the epididymis, so you see surrounding epididymal tissue. It's nodular, and it can be hyperechoic, and it's sometimes it, it's varied in its appearance. Because of the inflammation associated with that and the ischemia, there's um, not infrequently a hydrocele scene. Again here, appendix epididymis torsion. You see um, enlargement and scrotal skin thickening on the right side with the normal left side. And so the left side, we're gonna dispense with that. And on the right side, what we see here within the epididymis, again, separate from, <coughs> separate from the testicle, but within the epididymal head, a rounded, well-circumscribed avascular structure with relative hyperemia of the adjacent epididymis. So again, this is a torted epididymis, appendix epididymis. So torsion of the appendix testis, similarly diminished or avascular hypochoic mass, usually seen separate from the epididymis between, and you may have reactive hyperemia of the surrounding tissues. So that's just a test to make sure everybody's awake. Um, you may have an associated hydrocele and it's self-limiting. So again, we see this structure. It's separate from but adjacent to. Um, and again, similar features with reactive changes around adjacent scrotal skin thickening. So uh, the last time I promise, my rotation ball is who is here for the, the last talk I gave? This is an interactive session. Arms up. No? Okay, so I'm gonna, I'll go through it again, but briefly. So malrotation and wagulus, rapid onset bilious vomiting, 90% first year of life, usually first month of life, always at 2 a.m., uh, bloody gastric aspirates and blood in the stool. It's amazing how many questions for malrotation and wagulus do not happen between eight and six. I don't know what it is, but anyway. Abdominal pain and distension, and irritable child. Again, we can see distended upper loops. If you have any loops at all, it can be varied appearance on x-ray. And an x-ray to exclude malrotation is useless, as I said before. So if that is the question, you need to pursue other imaging. Every GI findings, uh, corkscrew appearance if you get it, or proximal obstruction. And again, meticulous detail with positioning. So here with the uh, proximal obstruction and beaking seen at the D2, D3 junction and quite active reflux back into the um, esophagus due to the obstruction. Now if you're fortunate enough for it to pass through, you get this beautiful corkscrew appearance. 
I can assure you that usually uh, requires some doing, and you can see in this child, it was actually an older child where we found this um, um, malrotation in volvulus. Again, the reason being is that there's a short vascular pedicle between the two, and anything that has a short mesenteric root or short zone of tethering is free to twist upon itself. Um, so again, low position of the duodenal to genal junction. It's not uh, at the level of the duodenal cap and a short pedicle. Cross-sectional imaging and malrotation of obvious. We talked about this a little bit before. Um, sonography is, is a complementary role and it's sometimes incidentally found. Um, we seek it out actively in all patients. So anyone that comes for an abdominal ultrasound, uh, that's actually part of a report and part of our um, um, performer at, when we look. CT has a limited role, again, but we can see things on CTs that are done for other reasons. Um, swirling in vessels is the key, and just because something is malrotated does not mean it's got volvulus, and just because you have volvulus does not mean you have malrotation. So again, reversal of the superior mesenteric artery and vein relationship, you can see that these are both abnormal with the vein abnormally positions with regard to the superior mesenteric artery. It should be over here. And this is mirrored in the ultrasound. Whirlpool sign on CT and on um, ultrasound, you can see the swirling of the vessels, congested venous channels, and twisting around the vascular pedicle. And if you scroll up and down on the CT scan, much like sweeping the transducer, you will see that swirling. Again, I would argue that you have to look for it on an ultrasound and you have to recognize it on CT. It's unbelievable how many CTs we look at that it actually hasn't been recognized because frequently we're not looking for it outside our index patient population of less than a year. So here's a, a case with volvulus without malrotation. So this was a child um, with um, spina bifida and had a secostomy, had mobilization of bowel for various different procedures. And she kept coming back being obstructed. And you can see on the CT scan that was done that there is this um, beaking of dilated bowel with air fluid level and then twisting around the pedicle here. And in this case, because the bowel was mobilized for a secostomy and for various different procedures that she had, um, it was non-fixed, and as well, she had a rent in her mesentery. So in this case, it allowed um, movement of the bowel around um, the vascular pedicle of a component of the bowel. Again, another patient, uh, he was a child, um, I forget what uh, surgical history that he had had, but again, you can see quite readily that this child is massively obstructed with uh, multiple air fluid levels on the upright few and significantly distended colon. You can appreciate, thankfully, a few hostile markings, so you know at least that it's distal. In this case, uh, it was uncertain as to what was going on, and so um, you can see that there's some abnormal branching. So that's, that's something else to look for. If you're not actually looking for the torsion knot, one of the first clues is that the vessels don't arborize or branch normally. Throughout the mesentery, it should go with smaller and smaller branches as you go towards the distal bowel um, on the mesenteric side. So if you see that the, the vessels are getting larger or disorganized or aren't branching normally, it should raise some alarm bells that something's not quite right. You might not know what's not quite right, but that it's not quite right. And you can see here in this child that there's actually similarly a twisting of the sigmoid and descending colon and the beaking going to that segment. So this child had a sigmoid volvulus. Gastric volvulus is pretty um, unusual. We don't see it too often, or we do. We mostly dismiss it. Um, but that would be the other type of gastric volvulus. Mesenteraxial gastric volvulus can cause um, ischemia and compromise because it is twisting on its uh, pedicle and is usually um, more severe. It presents differently than the organoaxial gastric volvulus because organoaxial volvulus will frequently still have the stomach able to empty. And in mesenteraxial volvulus, that's not the case. Usually it is obstructed. See a paucity of distal gas because of that. 
And the key here on this study is that you have overlapping of the pylorus and the fundus, which is quite unusual. So in this case, we are using the nasogastric tube as an indicator as the location of the esophagus. And you can see that the pylorus is actually right next to it. So that's not normal, that we all agree on. And so if the greater curvature is progressing superior and laterally, it's because it's twisting upon itself. And when you're uncertain as to what's going on with the stomach, certainly placing a nasogastric tube, and in this case he's obstructed anyway, so that makes perfect sense. You can see the unusual course and the relation of it to the stomach itself. As I said, mesotrax, or gastric bobulus, is more likely associated with ischemia. We see these also in cases of children who have had repaired congenital diaphragmatic hernias, again because the fixation is abnormal. Another image here where you see further contrast installation and again the beaking of the pylorus right next to the gastroesophageal junction. So again, having the two separate but near each other is the key here to this finding and the rather globular appearance of the stomach itself. As I said, organoaxial boglis, this is a frontal view. You can see that unusual appearance with the pylorus pointing inferiorly. You can see that it's um, it has this unusual sort of medial beaking and then over. And a few times these are mistaken as um, mid-gut foglis because again, you can see a course through configuration depending on uh, how distended it is. Again, you can see that the um, gastroesophageal junction is anterior and the, the um, antrum of the stomach and the greater curvature is to the right and superior of the lesser curvature. So, more interesting cases, splenic torsion and wandering spleen. We don't see this too often. And in patients that present with abdominal pain, we really just rely on the organs being where they're supposed to be. So when you see something where it's not supposed to be, that should raise some alarm bells. And this is a child who had several presentations before it was discovered that splenic torsion was the, the issue. Her spleen was found to be in an abnormal, um, an abnormal position, but it wasn't recognized that it was actually torting upon itself. So acute mid-abdominal pain can be chronic and remitting, nausea and vomiting, tender palpable mass in the mid to lower abdomen. The first three of those are pretty non-specific, so they're not all that helpful, but what do you look for? So the spleen will not be in the left upper quadrant, instead you'll see uh, bowel gas and, and bowel loops in the splenic fossa. What you need to look for is the world splenic pedicle or the torsion. And the spleen can extend across the midline in low position. And due to vascular engorgement, it can be quite large. Um, lack of enhancement and vascular flow and splenic parenchyma is also something to search for. You wouldn't see that necessarily. Um, well, the lack of flow you would see on ultrasound, but uh, certainly the lack of enhancement on other cross-sectional imaging. So this was a girl who had um, the spleen not seen in the left upper quadrant, the world splenic pedicle, and the spleen extended across the midline. You can see that uh, this is actually part of the spine and it's going all the way across with a midline lie. And near absence of Doppler flow. So even though you know we have fairly wide um, gait on this uh, Doppler, there's very little flow within the spleen. She went on to have a CT scan after, uh, I think, two occasions. And you can again see that the, the absence of the spleen, where you would expect it, and instead this midline kind of transverse lie of the spleen with the uh, twisted vessels um, coming near it. And I think I'm getting jumpy myself. And you can see in here that um, this is actually a partially thrombosed vessel because of the ischemia related to it. Again, um, look for the torsion knot. If you don't know what to look for, you won't see it. And in this case, it wasn't, um, we can see that the spleen uh, wasn't perfused, but the torsion knot um, wasn't commented on in the report. Again, um, the child went on then to have the spleen pexed. Um, rather than removed, so it was just pexed in position in the hope that it would regain some function. But on um, radio-labeled uh, scan, 
no uptake was seen, so it was a cold scan. Only the liver uptake was demonstrated. Three months follow-up, the spleen itself remains avascular, smaller, has some flux of calcification in it, and in two months follow-up, you see this irregular heterogeneous parenchyma that is the residual of the splenic tissue with further calcification and non-function. So, a more unusual beast, accessory lobe of liver torsion. Now sometimes this is seen with um, uh, gallbladder involvement and sometimes not. In our case, this was not diagnosed um, preoperatively. This was thought to be a um, tumor of uncertain origin, whether it was a rhabdo or, or something or other, or possibly um, trauma. The child actually came because she was wrestling with her brother and um, ended up having um, immense pain after. So I'm sure the brother got in with a great deal of trouble and was blamed for everything, but um, that's probably not the case here. So again, acute abdominal pain, and um, the consideration here is that it requires a high index of suspicion. It's not that common. But there was an awful lot of imaging done and an awful lot of anxiety that those parents had to endure thinking that their child had a liver tumor rather than a torted lobe of liver. So on ultrasound initially, um, there's some mild intrahepatic bowel duct dilatation. You see this heterogeneous echogenic mass with some central hypocoic areas. It's in the gallbladder fossa, so you can see the gallbladder next to it. Um, and what's and the liver parenchyma adjacent to it. Uh, has reasonable flow within it. If anything, it might even be a little hyperemic adjacent to it with relatively poor flow other than here in the gallbladder wall. What's interesting is that the twisting of the hepatic vessels on that ultra scan, ultrasound scan were actually imaged, but it wasn't recognized. And that's what I'm trying to bring attention today is that you only see what you know. So after this, you will know it, so you will see it. Um, when it comes along. So important to see and not to ignore, again, this abnormal branching and dilatation of vessels in a place where you don't normally see them. It's very unusual to see swirling of vessels in and around the porta hepatis such as this. And when you look carefully at this heterogeneous mass, you can see flow within and around it and just beside it and some areas of central necrosis within it. You don't know what it is, but clearly there's some torsion associated with this. On CT scan, again, a mass was found. It's quite concerning. It looked necrotic um, because it was relatively avascular, only some peripheral flow. Things were displaced, very edematous in there. It's difficult to identify the origin of this lesion. Um, the gallbladder wall adjacent to it was thickened due to the ischemia and inflammation. So there's a whole lot of things, real estate-wise, that were implicated as the cause. Again, so there is a poorly enhancing mass. Who knows what it is? Again, if you look at the CT that was done at the time, similarly, these twisting and swirling of the hepatic vessels leading to this lesion were present. They weren't recognized. And again, the unusual branching was there, but wasn't recognized. The issue with accessory lobes is that there's a narrow pedicle that extends to these accessory lobes, a narrow pedicle of parenchyma that extends and along with it, the vascularity. And so because of that, they're not fixed and they're easily, maybe not easily, but they do twist. <clears throat> so six days after, where the parents thought that the child had a horrible tumor or something, or we don't know what, um, to settle down, there were a lot of other studies done. And what we see is this uh, shows shortly halo of low signal on the gradient images, which is the hemosiderin rim or fibrotic capsule, intermediate T1 and T2 from subacute blood, and portal edema. So again, you can see this abnormal tissue here, peripheral hypo, hypo dense, hypo intense rim, and heterogeneous uh, material within with hemorrhage. So still, the idea of torsion was not considered. It wasn't raised. It was, we don't know what it is, but it's probably better out than in. 
of no, there were no um, biochemical markers that were positive, so that wasn't helpful either. So certain laboratory tests had been done, but that wasn't helpful. So in this case, it was a post-operatively diagnosed accessory lobe torsion. Again, the key thing, though, of all of these things is to look for the pedicle, look at the vascularity, and if it's abnormal in size or branching or direction, then it should raise some keys that something is going on and that perhaps it's a torsion. Again, this is a thing that we encounter not infrequently, and I actually had a case where the kidney was torted, but I, I couldn't find it. But, um, because my, uh, before coming here three weeks before, my computer was wiped out, so I had to start all these talks over again. So uh, <laughs> I had to try and find this one. So this one is as close as I could get. And it's where a child had renal tumor. And so they had this, uh, the kidney position like this initially. And then post-operative, the CT shows that the kidney is no longer in the retroperitoneal space. It's actually anterior. And while it's folded on itself, it hasn't gotten to the point where it's twisted. But again, because this kidney is no longer fixed, it's free within the peritoneum, it's at higher risk of torsion as well. So this is something to keep an eye on and make sure that when you see a um, visceral position such as that, that you go back and see whether it was normal and what the case is. So in this case, it's been mobilized and it's now intraperitoneal. So it's not torted, but at a risk for torsion. Now this is a rare bird here, lung torsion, and it's, not, it's nothing um, common to pediatrics and it's not common to adults but it is more common post-operative situations. So in this case, a uh, child had a tracheoesophageal fistula repair. You can see there's initially this child pre-op. It's got a replogal tube in place, um, aerated lungs, um, heart looks pretty normal. And then post-TEF repair, right thoracotomy, it's got a chest tube in place, and then he's starting to develop consolidation here. Right? We're starting to see this rounded consolidation blurring of the costophrenic margin. And it's not unusual post-op in the chest to either have some component of either hemorrhage or consolidation atelectasis. So that was just commented on and um, watched. The child continued to deteriorate. And so the question was whether or not there was an effusion there that was not resolving or loculated, not drained by the chest tube. And so went on to have an ultrasound so rounded area of consolidation, it's got some internal air that you can see, it's a little bit of branching. This is complex pleural, pleural fluid in the pleural space. And there's some internal vascularity, but it doesn't look quite normal. You would expect, at least in um, lung, to again have a normal branching pattern. Um, and the vessels were only seen in the large vessels. Certainly the peripheral area wasn't seen in. This had a very bizarre configuration in that it was rounded. Um, and any of you who aren't used to looking at uh, chest ultrasound, you normally see somewhat angular margin of a collapsed or consolidated lung with peripheral um, pleural fluid outlining it. And the other thing that's unusual is that it's quite medial adjacent to the heart. So post-op day three, non-resolving consolidation. So, okay, what's going on? Had another ultrasound. We like our ultrasound. So again, this time it was a different person that interpreted it. The persistent rounded consolidation, and it had mass effect. And you can see the liver here, this right lobe, which is again rounded and very bizarre in configuration with even less aeration and even less vascularity, and immediately adjacent to the heart with high resistance arterial flow. And the arterial flow normally in the lung is actually quite low resistance. So again, something not quite right. At this time, it was actually raised the possibility that it was a lung torsion. And the CT scan was done, and I apologize for the um, poor quality here, but unfortunately in babies, this is pretty much what you get when they have a nasogastric tube. Again, you can see the congested vessels centrally with some twisting. You can imagine that this is twisting upon itself, and again, obstructed and abnormal branching of a right pulmonary vein. So here you can see the abnormal branching done on the um, three-dimensional images that we have. 
Again, this should not take this configuration. It should branch normally, arborize, and um, the pulmonary artery is rotated superiorly and laterally to where it ought to be. As well, you have the bronchial cutoff from the bone rendering CT due to the torsion, again, onto the um, airway. So abrupt cessation of the bronchus intermedius with lack of aeration, and that's why the air was eventually resorbed with no air bronchogram seen. So, with all of these things, what to take home? I know you're not gonna diagnose your next round pneumonia as a lung torsion, or at least I hope you don't. <laughs> but you won't see it unless you have a high index of suspicion for any of these things. Ovarian torsion, testicular torsion, those are common things we're used to looking for. It's when we're thrown a curveball and we're not sure what to do. The important thing is to go back to the basics. Look at the vessels, are they normal in caliber? Are they normal in direction? Do I see flow where I should see flow? More importantly, what's there, not there that I should be seeing? And sometimes that's the harder thing to see. Meticulous examination of the images, because as I've shown you, a lot of the findings were there, they just weren't interpreted correctly. Because we have and we frequently look at images with a preconceived notion. And so for that, you need to open your eyes and open your heart. Look for the vascular torsion knot and look for lack of and poor perfusion because that can be revealing rather than no perfusion. Thank you.